Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Almost afternoon. Good. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I bring you greetings from Dr. Alan Machado, our Florida Conference President. The lapel is not on. The lapel is not on. Is it a green light? Now it's on. Testing one, two. All right. We got power. More than just my power here. Bringing greetings from Dr. Alan Machado, our conference president in the Florida Conference. In fact, he, he tells me to make sure that I let people know that he brings his greetings. So that's not an insincere greeting. Like, that's from his heart. He says, I want to greet you. And so I send you greetings from our president. I'm glad to be here. My name is Juan Rodriguez, Florida Conference Youth Young Adult Ministries Director. I have the privilege to go around seeing churches uh, for God's glory and hopefully seeing them turn the tide and turn the trajectory from um, become a church that's extinct to a church that's vibrant with young people. And so that's part of the reason why I'm here today. Uh, I got a text from Patricia Dove. Did I say the name right? Patrice. Patrice? Patrice Dove. I got a text from her and she said, I would love for you to come and see if you can help us here at East Marina Beach and see what we can do to work together. And so I'm privileged to be here with you to start that journey with you. Uh, if you came for some reason to listen to a Christmas sermon, because you know the holiday seasons are here, uh, I'm here to tell you that you will be disappointed. Uh, I apologize for that. I'll stick Jesus in here. Maybe not his birth, though. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to learn together what God wants to do in this community and is doing throughout this conference in different churches. Sermon title is, What is Your Legacy? Let's pray. Holy and great God, as we take a moment here to just look into your word and look into uh, stories of hope, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us understand that you have a great calling in our lives, Lord. I pray that we would follow that calling, whatever that is, Lord, to honor you in these days. Holy Spirit, I pray that you continue to be here, Lord, and continue to pour out your greatness upon us. Help us to listen to your voice right now. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, and I pray that everyone here might listen to what you want to tell them despite what I say, Lord. So pour out your greatness here again, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a story of, a, of missionaries that went to the little island of Puerto Rico. And when they went to Puerto Rico, they shared the message of hope. They shared the message of the second coming. They shared the message of the Sabbath truth. And, and scores of people started resonating with that message. And, and scores and hundreds of people became Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And they followed God's truth and became disciples of Jesus Christ. One of those people was a guy named Manuel Mendes. Manuel Mendes full-heartedly just fell in love with Jesus Christ and followed God and became that Seventh-day Adventist follower of Jesus Christ. And as he continued to grow, he decided to become a pastor. So Manuel Mendes became the first Puerto Rican Seventh-day Adventist pastor in that island. His daughter becomes a missionary, works in the hospital there. And things seem to be going well, leading his own family and generations of people to the foot of the cross. He would go to different places around the island on horseback through the mountains sharing the good news of Jesus and the truths for this day and age. And as he's doing all of this, he then starts having grandsons. And one of his grandsons just, he's, he's excited about the church, but there's just something that he feels needs to change. This was the the early 1960s, he's a teenager, and he's wanting to see how God moves his own local church and reaching out to the community. So he has all these ideas, and he brings it to the pastor, all these ideas of outreach to reach the next generation of his era. But the pastor said, nah, those ideas are mm, too little bit risky, not sure we want to go there. And so he gets disappointed. He starts sharing with other people, but they're just not listening to him. They don't like his ideas very much. So instead of maybe working together with him, maybe helping him grow, maybe mentoring him, they just discard his ideas. They discard him. And he feels rejected. And so he ends up leaving the church of where his grandfather was the very first Seventh-day Adventist pastor of that island leaves the church, goes on his own different ways, goes into some bad habits, um, and continues on his journey and unfortunately just disconnected himself completely. Gets drafted into the army, goes and fights in the Vietnam War, and is there for years. When he comes back, away from the army, goes to Woodstock, those of you who know Woodstock era, 
goes to Woodstock during that time. Don't know if any of you guys went there, but uh, he went there. And ends up marrying a blonde lady with green eyes. They try to connect with the church again, but all they see is hypocrisy. So they leave at the right old age of 20. They leave the church 2021, 20, not interested in connecting with that Adventist church. That legacy was not passed on to them. Maybe the way it could have been passed on to them. There's many reasons why they left the church, and most are copies of why, why generations of people we know maybe have left the church or even left Christ. You know, same excuses or reasons packaged in a different wrapping and framed in different ways. Disconnection, hypocrisy, and the lack of their home churches being intentional to disciple them. You know, we can talk about all these reasons. But what is interesting is that we see the same dilemma played out in the Bible as well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Judges chapter 2, verse 6. Judges 2, verse 6. And we see Joshua there towards the end of his life, and Joshua being a person that was mentioned by Moses himself, is now towards the end of his own life. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, verse 6, Judges, Judges 2, 6, when Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. Verse 7. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance and Timna here in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. When I read this passage, my mind gets blown. Because you have someone like Joshua, mentored by Moses. Then you have the elders that worked with Joshua in that second generation after Joshua who, who know and understand as children. These are elders here, but they were kids back in the wilderness. These are the kids that were allowed to go into the promised land because all the older people weren't allowed. Those who had not followed God during that time in the wilderness or not, not believed that he was going to help them overcome at the beginning. So you have all these kids back then, now elders of the church, and, and there's a disconnection between Joshua, and Joshua's great, but between Joshua and the elders, there's a disconnection between that next generation. Because somehow it wasn't passed on to them the truth or their story and their experience of how God had been with them and gave them salvation from where they were, from where they went through in the wilderness and the miracles that they had seen because of God. And what was the result? What was the result? Verses 11 and 12 shows us the result. Judges 2, 11 and 12. <clears throat> and the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And serve the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. And when you go back to the book of Judges, you see all the crazy things that kept on happening, cycling through the generations. The result was even deeper in Bible history. In fact, we're going to fast forward from Joshua's era to the time of Nehemiah. Now, this is a huge fast forward, okay? This is like from the beginning of conquering this new promised land all the way past all the kings, David, Solomon, all the way past all of them, all the way till they are captured now by the Babylonians, even more so past that in Nehemiah's time, the Persian Empire is in charge, and Nehemiah is a servant of the Persian Empire or the Persian king. And so we go all the way to Nehemiah's time. And if you know the Bible story, you know that Nehemiah asked, led by God, to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And that's rich in the history of our own church when we look at prophecy. But he goes back and he starts rebuilding this wall. And as they're rebuilding this wall, they find a book. And this book is what we know now as part of the Bible. And they read a portion of this book and they realize, when they realize, when they read it, is that they had turned away from God, obviously, but not followed an important celebration of remembrance. This 
Until the celebration was the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, or, or Sukkot, as is known now. And so we pick up the story now in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Fast forwarding from Joshua all the way to Nehemiah. Check this out. Nehemiah 8, verses 16 and 17. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves. Now this celebration, you need to understand, it was a celebration of deliverance. It was a celebration of remembrance from how God had saved them from Egypt. How God protected them in the wilderness. They were to celebrate continuously and remember that awesome salvation that God had done on their behalf. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on the roof and the courts and the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate and at the square at the gate of Ephraim. The entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done, done, not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day, and there was great rejoicing. So something happened. From Joshua, beginner of the promised land, through all those kings that Israel and then Judah had, all the way now to after the captivity and being brought back to build this wall, that they didn't pass on the legacy, the remembrance of this great celebration, the tabernacle of Booth, this great celebration to remind them of what Jesus or what God had done for them in the wilderness. What God had done for them to take them out of slavery. A celebration of salvation. But they celebrated then. And the Bible says there was great rejoicing. Now we could go deeper into the story. But the point I want you to grasp is that the failure of the elders, parents, and leaders that came after Joshua to mentor, disciple, and truly love the next generation created a cycle of forsaking the Lord. It created that cycle. Something was missing where the baton wasn't passed. And it created a cycle of forsaking the Lord. And listen to this quote from Patriarchs and Prophets that I hope really cements this in our hearts today. And so the generation that had received instruction from Joshua became extinct. Idolatry made little headway. But the parents had prepared the way for the apostasy of their children. Something happened there. A disconnection between uh, birth parents and spiritual parents. The same thing happens today. The failure of parents, church leaders, or even church communities to love well, mentor, and disciple the next generation leads to a cycle of forsaking church and many times forsaking God's greatest plan for their lives. Now let's return to the story of Manuel Mendes and his, and his family. Going back to that first Puerto Rican Sunday of his pastor. So his grandson and his wife are up in the mountains. And the car breaks down. And they have no idea what's going to happen. Because they're in the middle of nowhere. This is like before cell phones, right? Uh, you get stuck somewhere, you got a cell phone, you're going to be okay. You get stuck somewhere back in the early 70s, like 1970 in the story, 1971, and you're in trouble. Especially in the mountains of Puerto Rico. Nowhere that you could go. So, he prayed. Manuel's Mendes grandson prayed. And he asked God, as he's smoking a cigarette, by the way, smoking a cigarette, asked God, God, if you get me out of this situation, I will stop smoking cigarettes and I'll consider going back to church. So out of nowhere, these lights turn on. He's able to see the car. He's able to fix the problem, put a band-aid on the situation. The car turns on. When he goes towards the beams of a car that he believes is shining towards him, the lights turn off and there is no car there. At all. So this was an indication to his grandson to come back to church. So him and his wife got rebaptized and came back to church. And when they got rebaptized, his wife was pregnant. And she was pregnant with me. So that's the story of two young adults that came back to church. And I praise God. 
Because I've been baptized twice, once in my mother's belly and once when I was four years old. But my parents, my parents, those two, did three things that has led me to where I am today. And in case you're wondering where I am today, just in case you're wondering, I'm in a place that I love Jesus Christ supremely. He is my best friend and Lord. And my greatest desire is to live in the center of His will, which many times can become very dangerous. So they did three things that helped in my process of being completely sold out to Christ. They instilled within me a great love and respect for the Bible as the voice of God. They, they, they helped me understand that the Bible is not just a bunch of stories that you can learn lessons from and gather principles from so you can live a better life. No, they instilled within me that when you read the Bible, you are listening to God speaking to you. Amen. So every time I open the Bible, that's God's lips speaking to me. So they instilled that within me. Great legacy they put that in me. They also instilled within me a huge importance in prayer as a means to communicate with God. So when I pray to Him, I'm not just saying, I'm not just asking for stuff and, and praying for blessings. I'm talking to Him like if I would be talking to a friend. Amen. That is their legacy. Question for you. What is your legacy? And third, and the one that connects with this message the most is that they placed me in an environment that had men and women that helped me understand God's love for me. <laughs> that helped me embrace grace. Because we talk sometimes about grace, but it's all up here. But when we embrace what truly Christ has done for us, it changes everything. Grace will always trump any law. Because grace helps us keep any law. But it starts with grace. So I was able to embrace the grace that God had for me. And they encouraged me. Those people that I was around and the church that I was with and the, and the people that surrounded that church, uh, they encouraged me to be a leader in their churches. I'm talking about Sabbath school teachers, youth leaders, pathfinder leaders, youth pastors, elders, and mentors and, and senior pastors that would surround me, love me, share Christ with me, and became intentional with me to become a leader. And that is the one thing that this, next, this new era of young people, because I am no longer young. I have gray hair. I'm, I'm about to hit 50 soon. All right? Yeah, it's amazing. It's good. It's helpless. Anyways, uh, so, uh, so uh, um, sorry, I forgot what I was saying there. I got lost track in the little rabbit hole there. All right, so, uh, so they put me in an environment where they asked me to lead. And that is the one thing that this next generation, uh, is, is that's the one main reason they're sticking around, is when you give them responsibility, it's more than just purpose. It's, it's being able to understand that God has called them to lead today, not tomorrow. So they put me in, in areas of leadership. I, I was preaching as a teenager. I was giving Bible studies as a teenager uh, in high school. I was asked to serve as an elder in my, in my early 20s. You know, this whole process in my life was just amazing because people believed in me. And I didn't know why, but I trusted in them. Now that I'm about to turn 47, not really 50, 47, it's just, you know, 50's around the corner, it's just barking, I can hear it. Now that I'm about to turn 47, I have an urgency to help churches understand the importance of discipling the next generation. That's my whole purpose to be here, is to help you understand the importance of discipling the next generation. And yes, you might look around and say, well, there's not that many people here that are young, right? But you've got pockets of young people here. And that's where you start. That's where you surround with love. What kind of legacy is the new Smyrna Seventh-day Adventist Church providing for the next generation? That's what you need to ask yourself. Real quick, what is the average age of this church, would you say? Just throw it out. The church clerk always corrects this after the worship service. So I don't know if your church clerk is here, but what would you say is the average age of this church? Of attendance? <laughs> 60, 65, all right? Do I hear any other numbers? 60, 65. Going once. How many? No, you like, you like that number? Between 60 and 65? All right. It's about right. 
I think I your eyes. I look around. I, I, I think I tend to agree with that. Yeah, very good. What would you say is the average age of New Spirit in the beach? More or less? 60, 60, 65. All right. <laughs> very good. I like that. Uh, New Spirit is actually considered one, one of the oldest towns of Florida. That people come to retire, right? Like your pastor, he came here to retire. He came here to retire. Then they said, hey, uh, you want to work for us? <laughs> he said, I'll give you a year. So two years later, <laughs> praise God, he's going to be able to retire December 1, December 21, and he won't come back, you know? <laughs> He'll be a lay leader, not a, not a pastor that has so much stress behind that. So the New Smyrna community uh, average age is 58. 58. A little bit younger than 58 years old. So yeah, you're, you're on the right track, and, and you kind of represent, kind of, kind of represent the community a little bit. And that's true, and that's good. So, so you kind of have an idea of the people you need to be reaching. And, and people do come here to retire, and that might be the reason why this church hasn't gone extinct, like a sermon that I've heard here recently. But that should be no excuse to reach out to generations that are a part of this community. May not be that many, but they're a part of this community. So what is your legacy? I got a call one day from an 84-year-old elder and home assassin. Anybody know what home assassin is? It's on the other side of the coast. Home assassin springs. He calls me up, he says, why? I said, yes, sir. We've been praying for 10 years for young people to come to our church because our average age is 80. 80. I've been there. He's not lying. Nor exaggerating. Our average age is 80. He's 84. Ex-military man. Lovely guy. Super tall. And we baptized a grandmother. And she has... Twelve grandkids. So we're ministering to her whole family. That was two years ago. Today, four of those twelve teenagers are baptized. Actively involved in the church. When I say actively, they hold leadership positions and they sit on the church board. They have a 12-year-old elder. They're the, most, they're the most progressive church in the Florida Conference. A 12-year-old elder? And, I may add, she's a female. She runs that whole soundboard. I went there, and no one messed with her. Like, she was a charge. She was telling the 70-year-olds and the 75-year-olds, hey, you need to go up now. Let's go. We have a time thing. 12 years old. I was like, this, this is unbelievable. It blew my mind. But the church has entrusted her to be a leader in their church. Because they realize, you guys are about 60 to 65, but if time continues here and you continue to have health, one day if things don't change, you will turn average age 80. And they realize, Homo Sassa, we really gonna die. Like if Christ doesn't come soon, we're gonna die. And, and when we die, this church is gonna close its doors. They have a food pantry, just like you. Serve people in the community twice a month, just like you. Been doing it for years. I don't know about that's like you, but all right, like just like you. And they're headed, or you're headed in the same direction they're headed. But you can change that. You can start thinking differently and be intentional with what you're doing for this community and the young people that are part of this church already. And it can only happen if we do it together. Listen, this, he's 84 now. When he was 83 years old, this man had an all-night party for 16 teenagers in his house. I am still in shock every time I say those words. I would not want to have 16 teenagers in my house now. 
I can't imagine being 83 years old. And he tells me, I'm just puttering through the night, Juan. I'm just puttering through the night. I don't know how much I can take. They eat and talk and want to go into my pool at all hours of the night. My wife and I can't take this. But he continues. He doesn't give up. And what I've learned is that when we work together, we can make a very sweet experience. When we work together, we can truly bless people all around us. It's kind of like that fruit, right? That fruit that, that when you first see it, it's a grape. But then eventually it could turn into a raisin. And so you have the diversity of age between grapes and raisins. But every time you partake of a grape or partake of a raisin, it's sweet. So today I want to challenge you to work together to become a sweet church where young and old together are doing great things for God. Because this is not about a youth program. This is about a complete church culture transformation. And it can happen here. Because if it happened in Homosassa, I know it can happen anywhere. Just work with who you have right now. Another example of how this plays out in the Bible, especially when talking about reaching the next generation, is through the example of Timothy. Listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1, 5-7. It was in our scripture reading today. 2 Timothy 1, 5-7. For I am mindful of, of the sincere faith within you. This is Paul writing to Timothy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, one generation, and your mother Eunice, second generation, and I am sure that it's in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, church leader got involved. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power and love and discipline. So what Paul is showing us there is that it takes a family of generations and it takes a church leader like himself to invest into the next generation like Timothy. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen together. So when I received the text from Patrice, it reminded me of a call that I had received ages ago. I would say probably around 2000, 2001. I had started to serve, I was pastoring and I was serving as an associate youth director for the conference at that time. And um, a lady by the name of Aunt, her name is Patty, and Patty Crouch was her name. And um, everybody called her Aunt Patty. When I met her, I knew why, a loving woman. And uh, she called me up crying. And she said, I'm about to leave the church. She was a youth leader for her church in Perry, Florida, 45 minutes southeast of Tallahassee. I'm about to leave the church because they don't understand that our young people are dying everywhere. And we need to somehow reach them, but they're not willing to think out of the box. So I started to talk to him and said, hey, you know, leaving the church is probably not the best thing. You know, God, I'm sure wants to do something through you. Maybe we can work together. Let's see what we can do and help your church out. So I went over there and I survey the area and, and we talked and, and, and we planned and we dreamed, we, we dreamed with, a, with the church a family and we dreamt with the young people together just coming up with different ideas of what God could possibly do in that community. They had three young, four young people that went to the church, four young people that went to the church. So that they decided to start some kind of ministry to reach out to their friends. They ended up reaching more than 800 young people in their community. Woo. And only four of them were Seventh-day Adventist kids. It was the biggest youth ministry in Taylor County. Baptist churches, the big Baptist church, would come to Washington and say, what are you guys doing? They're in Paris. So if it can happen in Homosassa, and it can happen in Perry, it can happen here. And I'm not thinking numbers, because it's a different era. That was back in the early 21st century. We're 20 years, and, and everything's changing. But I know this, 
that in this era, young people are looking for people that are our age, my age and older, to mentor them and help them navigate through this life. Because social media and YouTube has changed everything. They know more than us, but they need the wisdom 